This is the second in a series of lectures on algebra for students of MS 2013 and MS 3014 at University College Cork. In the previous lecture, we talked about quotients and remainders of integers and about greatest common divisors of integers. In this lecture, we want to think about the same material, but in a slightly uh, more advanced approach using uh, the so-called extended Euclidean algorithm to try and find more uh, detailed information about, about the, uh, the way in which we can express the, the greatest common divisor. So we're thinking about the extended Euclidean algorithm. Algorithm. Um, so this is a trick for improving slightly what the technique that we've already learned for finding for finding uh, GCDs. Um, it's a theorem due to Bezu, um, and it says that if we have integers b and c, um, then there are our, uh, there exist integers. That's the, again the exist symbol. There exist integers s and t, uh, so that if we add s times b plus t times c, so we think of these as the like vectors and these are like scalars, so we add that, that combination of them, so to speak. But of course, they're really all integers. Um, so s b plus t c is the GCD of the two b and c. Um, and these s and t are called Bezu coefficients. Okay, so um, so we're going to try to figure out uh, not only this abstract theorem that they exist, but we're going to figure out how to calculate them. So we want to actually find Bezu coefficients. Um, so how do we find them? Um, let's start off with a simple, very simple example. B and C will be just uh, 12 and 8. Okay, so then we can put them into a matrix like this. It's a very simple trick. It's very similar to linear algebra when you learned about Gaussian elimination. Um, what do we do? We always put the identity matrix in here, two by two identity matrix. It's always one, zero, zero, one, those four numbers and nothing else. Um, and then the two numbers that we had here, this is B and this is C. We just put them into matrix like that. And then we're going to do some row operations on this matrix. Remember how row operations worked when we learned Gaussian elimination in linear algebra. You learned that you could add any multiple of a row to another row and that that wouldn't, uh, wouldn't cause any trouble for the, for the linear equations these were to represent. In our situation, we're only going to allow integers. So we're going to allow on, only allowing an, uh, adding an integer multiple of one row to another row. We won't need to do any other row operations in, in this story. We don't need to, we could in principle swap rows, but it won't help us at all. We could uh, try to do some other row operations, but the, all we really need to do is add a multiple of one row to another row. So we're going to add integer multiple uh, multiples of one row to the other. But how do we decide which ones to add? What we're going to try to do is to get the smaller one, in this case the 8, to knock as much as possible out of the bigger one, the 12. Okay, That's the idea. Kill as much of the 12 as it can. So let's see how we do that in practice. Um, we take, uh, again, our, our matrix, and it's always the same. It's always um, 1, 0, 0, 1 to start with. And then 12 and 8 were the numbers we chose to work with. How much can I, of the 12 can I kill with an integer multiple of 8? I'm going to add a minus. Uh, this row to that row to kill as much of the 12 as possible. The 8 is going to try and kill as much of the 12 as it can, and so I'll add minus 8 to 12. But remember, we have to do row operations a whole row at a time. You can't just add one number to another number. You have to add a multiple of this row to that row. It has to be done a whole row at a time, just like in linear algebra. And we'll explain why in a little bit when we think about why, why this, is, this uh, technique is going to work. So what happens when you add minus this row to that row? minus 1 of the second row to the first row, you're going to get 1, minus 1, and then 8. Taken away from the 12 gives you 4, 0, 1, 8. The second row doesn't change at all. And now, I'm going to give the smaller number is now the 4. So, And when I say smaller, it should be smaller, of course, in absolute value, really. Um, uh, in this case, it's positive, so it's not a problem. We can fit two 4s into an 8. So minus 2 of first row to second row, giving us... Um, the first row doesn't change. And the second row, we get minus 2 of this to this. 
minus 2 minus 1 is a 2, added to 1 is a 3, and then uh, we get 4 fitting neatly into the 8, giving us 0. And now we're done. Um, the story comes to an end um, because we've got nothing left here. But then it turns out that this row is going to give us the, our useful information here. This is going to be exactly um, going to give us exactly the, the bazooka coefficient s, t, and then that's going to be the GCT, the 4. So you can see how to do the calculation. Again, you stopped because you found a 0 here. There's a zero in one of these two entries, and so that means you stop. Um, so you're done. And then the non-zero guy here, this is the four, so one of them becomes zero, the other one's still not zero. It's the GCD, and those are the bazoo coefficients. Now, there, there is, of course, a, a, a tiny uh, issue that um, what if uh, we get a negative? Uh, instead of that four, what if we got a negative? Um, so if you had some some number, some number, and then a negative here, you just change the sign across the whole row. So we're allowing ourselves the possibility to flip the sign across the whole row, if that happens. Um, and uh, okay, I haven't got an example, but anyway, so if we ha if we had ended up with something like seven, nineteen, and uh, minus twenty three, and then uh, four. 12 and 0, then um, what we would do is to say, well, that's not that's not allowed. A minus can't be a GCT. GCTs had to be greater than or equal to 0. And so the answer wouldn't be that, but it would instead be minus 7, uh, minus 19, and 23. That's S, that's T, and that's the GCD. So that's how we can find the Bezu coefficients. But we haven't proven that it works. Uh, we need to see why this technique works. And that's going to be some uh, very simple linear algebra. So we want a theorem, which is that the extended Euclidean algorithm, which is what I just showed you, um, algorithm uh, computes Bezu coefficients. And GCD. OK. Um, so why is that true? The first part of the proof is to just forget about the entries that we had at the, that started off being identity matrix and did whatever they did in the first two, um, the first two columns, and just think about what's happening in the last column. Let's focus here, and we'll forget about this for the moment. Just make, make think of that as some mess that we're not worrying about. What happens here? What we did was to divide as much of the smaller into the larger as we could. So in other words, the next step after we do the first step. Uh, the next step is uh, is that we have, if let's say C is the smaller one, then B is replaced by the remainder when we divide as much C into it as possible because we subtracted as many copies of C from B as we could, an integer number of copies. And that means we're left over with, with the remainder. So we've got as much, rid of as much B as we can, leaving this remainder. And so um, and we just keep going like that. Uh, on and on and on. So that means that at each step we're doing exactly, in the last column only, we're doing exactly the steps that we did previously for the Euclidean algorithm where we calculated out um, the GCD by repeatedly replacing the bigger number by the remainder when divide out by the smaller one. And so as a consequence, after a number of steps, I don't know what happens here, 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 or here, but eventually I must have a zero and a GCD or the other way around, something, 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 a GCD, and, um, and a zero. Um, I don't know what these, these first four entries are going to be, but we'll worry about them next. OK, so let's think about those, those four entries in those first two columns. What is happening there? Um, when we start, we started with 1, 0, 0, 1, and some number, and some number. And um, what I want to claim is that this matrix satisfies uh, some, some linear equation, a very simple linear equation, b, c, minus 1, equals, well, if you expand that out with your fingers, 1b, no c's, minus a b, gives you 0. No b's, 1c, minus c, gives you 0. So what the matrix we started with multiplies by this vector to give me 0.
Now when you carry out row operations, you know from linear algebra they don't alter the kernel of, of, of a matrix. They alter the image, but not the kernel. Uh, so the kernel of this is always going to stay the same all through all the row operations that we carry out from the theory of Gauss elimination or from the more or less elementary fact that any integer multiple of this guy added to this guy will still have the same, uh, still kill this vector. So um, not too hard to see that this means that when you go through the entire process, I don't know where we end up, but we end up somewhere when we're all done, we know we end up with something that's going to be some numbers, some numbers, I don't know what's here, I don't know what's here, I don't know what's here, what's here, but we know that the greatest common divisor stayed here, let's call it D, um, and, or, and zero, or we said that there were some numbers, first four numbers, I don't know what they were, and zero and D, D was the greatest common divisor. Um, and then these two were some numbers, call them S and T, and then I don't know what numbers go here, or these, I don't know what they are, and these are little S and T here. So it ends up being one of the other, these. And we know that's the GCD, but um, when we go through the steps, this linear equation still holds. And so if you plug in the fact that the linear equation still holds, again, that's general theory of linear algebra, or the general theory of Gaussian elimination, how it affects kernels, matrices, this must still hold. And I can ignore that row and just look at what I get by expanding this multiplication, matrix multiplication out. I get S, B, plus T, C, minus D, equals zero. And that's the equation for the uh, for these being Bezu coefficients. So we know we can calculate Bezu coefficients. We have an explicit uh, formula for doing it. We have an explicit recipe for how to calculate it. Perhaps a more intuitive description of these Bezu coefficients. What are they? Where do they come from? We're st we still haven't really seen what we do with them. Why would we want them? Um, but one simple uh, fact about them that makes them maybe a little bit more uh, intuitive. If we have B and C integers, uh, not both zero, uh, then we can say that the GCD of the two numbers B and C, of the set of B and C, um, is the smallest positive integer of the form ST plus, uh, sorry, SB plus TC, which is the form that our, our, our GCD had from our from our basic coefficients story. Um, so uh, the proof, well, let's let D, um, let's define colon equals means is defined to equal uh, the GCD, B and C. And um, then D does have this form. D is S, uh, SB plus TC for some, some choice of S and T we know. Um, and on the other hand, uh, D divides B, say um, it's, a d it's a greatest common divisor, so it's a divisor, and so B has to be some multiple, it's called capital B of D, and then D divides C, say little C is big C times D for some B capital B capital C, right? Um, and now what we can do is we can write an integer, um, write out some uh, integer of the form S uh, B plus T C and then write out that B is B D capital B D and C is capital C T and that's S B plus T C times D um, and so this is divisible by D they must all be divisible by D and so we can uh, we can ensure that all integers either of this form are divisible by d, and d is greater than or equal to zero. It divides into some such integer, but it actually divides into all such integers. Okay, so that gives us a result that gives us some more sense of what is going on. We take all the, we could think of these as integer linear combinations. If you imagine b and c are sort of like vectors, although of course they aren't really vectors, they're just integers. But you imagine this is sort of taking a linear combination of them. And we found that this is the smallest some sense linear combination of them. Bezu coefficients are useful for us. Uh, theoretically, we'll see them in various proofs, but we'll also eventually see them in uh, computations as well. So they're, they're not just a powerful theoretical tool. They're also very useful for lots of calculations that we're going to do later on. So let's think about um, prime numbers and um, 
how they fit into this story about dividing things into things. Of course, they're the things you can't uh, you can't break apart. So an integer p, which is uh, is is called prime, if uh, p is greater than or equal to two, and um, the only um, positive integers that divide p are 1 and p. So here's a, a useful fact about, about primes that we'll, we'll use a lot. Um, suppose we have b, c, and d are um, integers. And suppose d divides um, the product b times c. Does it divide any of the factors? And suppose that d is coprime to b. What does coprime mean? Means that the GCD of b and d is one. That's what coprime means. Co to be coprime means to have GCD one with respect to each other. So they're coprime to each other because they have the GCD one. That's what that means. So, um, so then, uh, then we want to claim that in fact uh, d divides divides c. So if, if d divides the product and it's coprime to one of the factors, it must divide the other one. Um, and the proof is um, that uh, so d divides bc. Um, so there must be some quotient and no remainder into bc. Um, b and d are coprime. In other words, they have gcd1. So that means that there must be some bazoo coefficients, S, B plus T. D equals 1, not C here, because it's B and D that are coprimes. So there's bazoo coefficients for B and D. That's this S and T. There'll be bazoo coefficients for, for B and D. And then um, we can write then, uh, if we multiply across by C, we get S, B, C plus T, D, C is C. But then we know um, that B, C is Q, D. And so S, Q, D plus, sorry, plus T D C is C, uh, but then we can factor out uh, S Q plus uh, T uh, T C D, um, and so D divides C, um, and so the result we wanted to prove. Okay, so bazoo coefficients make these sort of these theorems more more um, somewhat more explicit than uh, the more abstract theory of working with prime numbers without the bazoo coefficients. When you have these bazoo coefficients, you can write down these very explicit equations, and then uh, these primality theorems become a little bit simpler. So in particular, as a, as a consequence of this result, we can say that if we have a prime number, if we plug in d being prime, get a corollary, um, which is that, um, so corollary is something that follows easily from the previous thing, is that a, um, a prime p divides a product of integers um, just when it divides one of them, one of the factors in the product. Um, and that we'll use a lot. And why is that true? Because uh, it's coprime to everything. And so it has to um, divide into the other factor. It's coprime to the B, so it divides into the C. Um, it's coprime to everything but itself. OK, so then um, we want the big theorem that um, there is a unique, unique prime factorization. of any uh, positive integer. Let's say what that means first. Um, clearly, if we want to factor this guy into primes, it's going to be 2 times 2 times 3. But it's also, of course, 3 times 2 times 2, or it's 2 times 3 times 2. So, uh, it's, so it's not the, um, it's, it's, it's unique except up to ordering, right? It's unique up to reordering. So you could say it's unique if we order uh, by 
making sure that each factor is less than or equal to the next one. Um, so alphabetically, so to speak, order the factors. Um, and uh, so that's one uh, thing to point out. Uh, what that's what a prime factorization is, and we have to worry about this uniqueness notion. Uh, the other thing to point out is that, of course, there is a, an issue about uh, what if there aren't any prime factors at all. For example, one is a is a positive integer, um, and that that's a tricky issue because then we'll have to define. So this is a sort of a dangerous point. Uh, uh, what's the product of uh, uh, product of the empty set of numbers. Empty set of numbers um, is always defined to be one. So if you have no numbers at all, you multiply them all together, you get one. It sounds strange because you don't have anything to multiply, so how could you get anything? But uh, we'll, we'll use that as a definition of a product of an empty set of numbers. That's a convenient definition. It sounds a little strange, but it's helpful. And it makes simpler statements for this sort of theorem. So to make the theorem a little more convincing, let's just look at some more uh, examples of prime factorizations to be sure that we know what we're talking about when we do fa prime factorization. So one is, is, is factored into no prime numbers, uh, empty set of prime numbers, of uh, prime numbers. Uh, two is the set of, it was factored into just a single prime number, two, it is prime. Three is factored into one prime number, three. Four is two times two. Five is just five, it's prime. 6 is 2 times 3, uh, 7 is again 7 prime, um, then 8 is 2 times 2 times 2, and uh, 9 is 3 times 3, and so on and so forth, right? So we can see that they're starting to have, that this is starting to work, at least initially, we're getting uh, prime factorization, and it's not too hard to convince yourself that it's unique. So let's prove that there is a unique prime factorization. Um, the first step is going to be that we'll try to prove uh, that there is a fact prime factorization, and then we'll prove that it's unique. So first we want to see that there is a prime factorization. So uh, we've already seen the first bunch of numbers having a prime factorization. Suppose 1, 2, dot, 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 n minus 1 have prime factorizations. Um, and then w when we run into some number n, we want to check and see that it does too. So we run into some number n, we ask if it does. Um, so the first possibility is that maybe it has no factors smaller than itself. Or no, no it's not a product of smaller factors. Um, let's say not a product of smaller factors. Um, then that's exactly being prime, so n is prime. And so n equals n is our prime factorization. If it can't be broken into a product of two smaller factors, then it's prime. Um, but if it can be broken into a product of two smaller factors, n is b times c, where b and c are smaller than n and positive, then what we need to do is to break them in to prime factorization so they each have uh, prime factorizations. And so we put those together. That's easy enough. You just write down the factorization for b and then the factorization for c, and then you could, of course, sort them into order. You sort the factors so that they do actually appear in this sort of alphabetical order, increasing factors, increasing size factors. So that means, therefore, that n must have a prime factorization. So now what we've proven is the existence of the prime factorization. We haven't proven that it's unique. So now we want to ask about the uniqueness. and um, so we suppose we have a prime factorization. Um, what we'll do is we'll take uh, p to be the smallest uh, prime uh, factor of n. Um, and so we can write n is p times something, say, n1, where n1 is, is smaller than, uh, than p. So this is smaller, um, sm sorry, smaller than n. Um, and so it, it uh, so it we can assume has a unique factorization. So n one has unique factorization. But then p has to appear in any factor of uh, factorization of n because it's the smallest prime factor. 
and so it has to show up there in any factorization. It appears in any factorization of n. And so we've got p, and then we've got all the factors from n1, and we put them in there. And there's no way that we could do it any other way. By induction, n1 has a unique factorization, and any factorization of n has to have the p in it, and then has to have whatever else is left over. But the leftover stuff has to be exactly what's in n1, and that's unique. And so that gives us the proof of the existence of uniqueness of the prime factorization. An immediate consequence of this is the, is the theorem of Euclid, that there are infinitely many primes. Uh, there are infinitely many primes um, and the, the proof is uh, suppose that we had a finite set so we take p1, p2, dot 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 pn a finite set of primes well, we can put little set brackets I suppose um, Suppose we have a finite set of primes, and let's let b be defined to be, again, colon equals for me always means is defined to be uh, p1 times p2 dot, 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 times pn, and let's set c be b plus 1, um, so it's even bigger. And then it's easy to see that b and c are coprime. Why are they coprime? Because um, you can just say that uh, c minus b is 1. And that gives you your bazoo coefficients, 1 times c plus minus 1 times b is 1. And that gives you a GCD, because you couldn't have anything smaller than 1 for the GCD. And so that is the calculation of the GCD right there. Uh, so they're coprime. But that means, therefore, that, uh, that these uh, p1 and p2 and so on, all up the way up to pn, are not, none of them are in the prime, the, uh, prime factorization. of the number c. Um, but it has to have a prime factorization, so there must be primes in, in its factorization, and they can't be among these. There must be more primes than these. Those aren't all of the primes. No matter how many primes I wrote down, they aren't enough to get through all of them. There are still more. That brings us to the end of chapter 4 in the lecture notes. In the next lecture, we'll look at modular arithmetic, which is the arithmetic of working with remainders when we quotient out as much as possible of some integer.